chartered accountant turned entrepreneur, Pradyumna Nag is a growth focused outsourced CFO. I just wanted to understand what this really means and how can startups look at adding the finance lens to everything that they do. But as I spoke to Pradyumna, I realized that he's unlike most finance folks that I have come across. He spoke about business metrics that a CEO wants to look at and not just compliance or regulatory requirements. One more thing that resonated a lot with me was how Prequate aims at first becoming a trusted advisor of founders and then the work follows. You must listen to this if you're a founder or a CXO of a startup and want to understand how a growth focused outsourced CFO partner can help you. This is the CTQ Smartcast, where we have conversations about up-leveling, deliberate practice, and getting future relevant. Hi, Pradyumna. Welcome to the CTQ Smartcast. Hi. Hi, Harish. Thanks for having me here. Yeah. So, first question is going to be uh, a tricky one for me, uh, an interesting one for me, but I think this is you know the first introductory uh, ball that you play every time you answer questions, right? So, how do you really define a growth-focused outsourced CFO partner? And how is it different from any other CFO advisory services or internal CFO? How is it different? Sure. Um, so, I think one of the biggest uh, changes that we, as, you know, let's say India, India and our approach to finance uh, that probably the West has adopted a lot better um, is how you look at the role of a CFO, right? So, most of the time when you think about finance or you think about a CFO, you're thinking about control. Right. Right? You're thinking about risk and measures. But uh, what really the role of a CFO is, is about management, right? Like what management really means is given a set of constraints, given a set of boundaries, what's the best that you can do or what can you help achieve, right? Which is a more critical aspect to the role that a CFO plays uh, in the West you know, the lot of credi- credibility has been given to the role of a CFO and how they can become partners to the CEO, right? Or many of the CFOs, uh, including the current uh, CEO of Uber, uh, were CFOs in their earlier life, right? Like how, how can they look at the constraints and see what's the best way or most optimal way to deploy assets and really take them? So one of the changes that I, at least I, when I describe myself is, you know, I use the word growth because growth, is a very important part of a CFO's role. Uh, but we tend to think, at least in India, even I used to think, you know, when I was uh, uh, back when in, uh, in KPMG, that the role of a CFO is, is, is as a guardian, mm-hmm. right? like somebody who's managing uh, um, a lot less than what I know today. Uh, but uh, the thing is that we as individuals and we as founders, you know, I'm again bucketing myself as a founder because it's convenient right now, but... Uh, we as founders also need somebody to kind of play that role of being a partner with us who's also looking at guardrails, who's also looking at measurements, who's looking at effectiveness. And end of the day, that's what will lead to growth, right? Like given the capital constraint, given the asset constraints, given the talent constraints, how do we do more? So um, that's kind of the role that I play uh, for most of the organizations that we work with uh, is how do you get more out of what you have? Right. Yeah. And and usually, is this uh, in organizations where uh, there is already an existing CFO? So do you augment that person, you know, in terms of maturity, capability? Or is it where, you know, you're actually playing the de facto CFO because they don't have an internal CFO? Yeah. So that, that's a great question. You know, usually when uh, the people who join us kind of find it, uh, find it very difficult to understand that why, you know, though we have the word CFO in our name, why we have a lot of client facing uh, members or CFOs themselves. Uh, but the idea is that with a CFO partner, right, what you're looking at is somebody to augment capabilities of the CFO itself and the existing team, because they're always playing a catch up role, right? Like if you look at any organization, which is in that spurt of growth, they're not there yet and they will never be, right? Um, they're always trying to build capabilities. They're always trying to respond to changes. They're trying to work with many investors. We become very easy plugins for them because we are very focused on certain outcomes, certain measurements, certain initiatives, and it becomes somebody that they can rely on and take them through that journey. So uh, a lot of the organizations that we work with, actually CFOs are uh, a large uh, part of our client base, um, right? But 
uh, we become somewhere in terms of a sounding board for them as well as the CEO, where the CEO can say, hey, run the simulation from me or run this exercise for me, which would be too taxing on the internal equipment or internal machinery in the organization. So we come in and provide that flexibility. So uh, to answer that question, large part is companies that have CFOs already. Uh, but again, groups of companies or groups of organizations, uh, you know, where we have, for example, a very large uh, internet publishing group. And there, the role that we play is a lot more in line with what the CEO wants out of the entire group and not necessarily with each team, right? So we somewhere fit in uh, directly as an assisting hand for him. Uh, rather than with each of the individual enterprises. Right, yeah. And and is there any specific, um, say, point in life cycle of the company or a company's size where engaging with you sort of makes uh, sense? What is the right, what is the sweet spot, spot for you that you want to be in? Um, so when, I mean, the calling card for us as an organization or us as a firm or us as individuals, uh, is complexity, right? So the second, there is a circumstance which requires you to think beyond your comfort zone, right? It could be, for example, adding a new vertical. Now that's very stressing on somebody who's not done it earlier. On what do I expect from this vertical? What should be my cost benefit analysis? What should be my expected outcomes from doing it, uh, right? So it can be as early as we, you know, we work with organizations where they had nothing except for a PowerPoint presentation. And we work with organizations that are that are you know publicly listed companies as well. Uh, but between all of them, what they really look for from somebody like us is a partner who can do all of these things very flexibly, very scalably, and also bring in a little bit you know the additional independent element uh, uh, into the exercise. So the stage does not really matter, but we insist that it has to be in certain stages of an organization's journey. Uh, simply because the expectations can be more easily managed or more easily covered, right? So, for example, in your zero to one stage, there's a lot of things that are happening within your organization where the product is the primary focus, right? So, somebody like us might be actually an overkill, right? We might be trying to bring in too much when actually you're, all you need to do is sit down and, and, you know, grind, right? But when it starts hitting that one to ten is when you need to put up, you know, measurement systems, where you need to put up system, general overall operating systems. And there we get a way to you know, partner with them. Or if it's in the 10 to 100, then how are they looking at the business, right? How can it be uh, made more efficient? How can it be made more effective? Uh, and that journey follows all the way you know, down its own line. And then if they're a listed company, they again need us for very specific initiatives, right? Like tell me, should I enter India? If I have to enter India, what should be my expectation? What can be my you know, pricing model? So there it becomes a lot more focused around specific initiatives but each of the cases the role that we play can be very wide or it can be very narrow it depends purely on what the organization needs at that point of time right yeah i can draw a lot of parallels with you know how we work because we work with companies with you know six people in the in the team to large listed fortune 50 companies right, right? on the culture front uh, obviously, yes, uh, you know, every great company should have everything sorted on culture right from day one, but that's not right. going to happen, right? There is right. going to be some culture that, that they will uh, incur, but you need to know what is the point of no return. Uh, there are points of inflection like when the companies are ready to scale 50 employees plus and you know, that is a time when they absolutely need to have articulated their culture. Uh, in a larger right. company, which has already you know created their culture document and all, it is about you know bringing that culture to life. So I can you know very nicely sort of uh, you know draw parallels uh, with with uh, you know what you guys uh, are doing. We are doing it on the culture side. You guys are doing it on the finance side. No, just to add, right? I mean, like uh, what you said, um, I see a lot of parallels when you say it too, right? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> for example, uh, uh, you know the first twenty employees, the culture is in practice. Yeah. Right. Beyond 20 employees, the culture is defined because that, you know, you have to have it in such a way that it, it is scalable, right? It might come in from systems, it kind of might come in from operations, processes, or how you deal with people or individuals itself. But let's say the 101st employee, he still has to be able to gel with the same uh, culture that comes in, which is the role that you guys play, right? Which for us is also similar to, you know, what we do. The 101 client should still feel like he's part of the first 100 clients that, that came in.
yeah 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 <laughs> that that that's uh, very nicely put but before we go ahead i had one question which i wanted to get out of the way so what is the story behind the name prequet sure oh, so uh, prequet is portmanteau for pre and equate so equate okay. is usually a post facto event right given or uh, the set of the you know e- like equation days right so right. Uh, you have your lhs and your rhs kind of defined Mm-hmm. what we really want to focus on or we always kind of uh, uh, we were trying to lay the foundation toward the part two is can you do that equation much before that event occurs right so which is planning essentially how you plan how to how you execute what are, how do you look at what you want to be able to achieve so uh, that's really the meaning of the word prequet uh, a lot of people don't uh, don't get it i mean they think it's so prequet but <laughs> there's really a lot of reason you know as our founders will always have a lot of back story to how they came up with the name so <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah so coming to founders right and uh, i think that's that's a great question to sort of get deeper into uh, you know your work as well so how can founders use finance to identify operational uh, you know blind spots because uh, we sort of assume that the ceo should have this you know overall lens and you know is is building uh, incorporating the finance view but a lot of times it is not sometimes it is gut feel sometimes it's more attachment to you know the way they see the world but the finance uh, lens is more of an afterthought so you know what do you say about this and how do you help uh, founders here so um, see if you really uh, you know scrape everything off right all the Uh, all the bells and whistles of running an organization the business model the idea everything the only true objective that remains is the numbers right like so you know you can say I, you've had a good year i can say you've had an okay year but the only objective measure is okay did you did you make 10 million in revenue right so uh, that number does not change irrespective of who looks at it most of the time when founders look at an organization or you know their approach to finance is usually driven by the standard set things like you know income statement or profit and loss account or balance sheet and cash flow statements they're, they're just prescription mm-hmm. right the government has prescribed a way in which you put in information so that that information can be filed with a registrar could be given to an mca uh, or it can be given to the income tax department or whosoever right it just sets a standard way in which you talk about numbers but really that's not what the business is all about that's not what finance is about finance is all those measurements and tiny little numbers and metrics that really make that number what that number looks like right so uh, if you look at a balance sheet there are 100 odd metrics that that you know you can really draw from a balance sheet right now a lot of them can be relevant a lot of them can be irrelevant to where you are as an organization and irrelevant as in maybe some other day i need to put a, put it on my watch window and then you know uh, figure things out but if you need to really understand what that number means and have a specific course of action that is defined by those numbers you need to be able to do a root cause analysis using those numbers now i don't see an organization being able to do a root cause analysis by purely looking at the income statement right it's a, it's a, it's a you know uh, post mortem uh, analysis report of what really happened or how that murder occurred right but if you really need to get in you have to look at all the tiny metrics that actually lead to you making a loss or making a profit and then look back at how those numbers depend on a lot of other you know operating decisions that you have taken uh, if you really get into finance and adopt finance most of the great founders have a very good grip on unit metrics right so if you look at one standard thing that they all have they have numbers on the top of them they don't have what is your you know balance sheet uh, uh, total right that's not what we're talking about they have what is important to be measured and they have that number in their mind at all points of time because they're always trying to draw what did i do with that number last month what did i do with that number this month what am i doing next month right and that is what you call as a good governance or a good founder right like in the way or in the approach in which he thinks because you know he can say that we've done we've had a fantastic year but if he feels that we you know underperform by 50% he's not going to say that he's not going to say we've had a great year right irrespective of whether it looks great or not from the outside so it's a very subjective measure but when you start looking at it it gives you a decision that you know maybe your pricing was off right or maybe your conversion numbers were off or maybe your user cohorts are not behaving the way they were you know you expected them to behave or uh, maybe the stickiness with which you set up the entire model uh, for how your business is going to grow uh, is not something that you are able to achieve right so it gives you a decision that you need to be able to take so founders when they have a lens of finance they can make very quick simple decisions 
that actually translate down into numbers at the end of the year, but more importantly, into metrics that they can understand and identify at this point of time. Right? If you don't do it, what happens is you're always looking at it from a catch up. Right? Oh, I should have done this. Right? If you look at it one year in, it's, it's redundant. If you look at it one month in, you're like, oh, I should have done this last month. But then you don't know what you're looking at. Right? If you have just these, you know, for example, your P&L and balance sheet, and those are throwing out numbers, you don't know what to do. You just know that that, that number exists. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, you spoke about metrics and, you know, different kinds of metrics. One, you know, really heartening thing is to actually listen to all these metrics from a finance guy, right? Uh, because uh, you are actually talking about the kind of things that business owners really appreciate and want to understand. And again, it's not about those, you know, the compliance regulatory requirements of PNL and, you know, balance sheet that, right. yes, I know I need to submit it somewhere. But uh, that is not what I'm looking for, right? I'm looking for things like these. Uh, so it's great to hear that. I'm, I'm sure, you know, founders uh, who listen to you must be really happy, you know, feeling happy that, you know, yeah, now we have a finance guy who's actually talking uh, in our language. But, you know, extending that uh, further. So what are these quantitative and sometimes qualitative measures that, uh, you know, founders should use to do a health check uh, you know, internet that, yeah, I'm going on the right track. Uh, how do you sort of help them identify these measures and uh, how, you know, easy or difficult are they to measure and track uh, on, on a continuous basis? And if you can give some concrete examples from, you know, different industries, domains, that, that will make this even more uh, tangible. Right. Okay. So uh, if you look at it from, you know, purely the metrics lens, right? Like every organization has those qualitative metrics and those quantitative metrics. Now, the qualitative metrics and quantitative metrics by themselves might not mean much, but the second they're kind of combined together, uh, they weave a story, right? They weave a very nice tale about what happened within the organization. Now, let's say NPS, right? Like, though it's expressed as a quantitative measure, it's really a qualitative measure or it's a qualitative score of how your user cohorts are behaving or how your user numbers are, uh, you know, are they healthy or not, right? So... Uh, for example, when we were working with uh, uh, one tech company, retention rates obviously are, are you know, extremely important, right? But when you're going on a spree to acquire customers, your CLTV is also very important because if you're going to do anything to extend the user journey, to add more products, to add more uh, use cases, or to say that, you know, I want to be upselling a certain program, right? Or I want to be able to reduce the price. Now, CAC by itself is not a good enough lens. So you need to have a way in which you identify and measure CAC in its relative terms to the CLD, right? So if I'm going to take, uh, you know, let's say I'm going to give a discount on a bulkier uh, package, right? That should really translate into me having a lowered CAC and lowered CAC coming from lower conversion or sorry, a uh, higher conversion, mm -hmm. right? So unless you have this whole story uh, nicely played out, your NPS numbers will not look healthy because your NPS is, is obviously coming in from something that happened or the events that happened within the organization at that point in time. So this is one example, right? If you look at another example of, let's say, you know, for example, an FLCG company that we work with, right? Multiple SKUs, products across multiple shelves. But when you run a pure analysis of what the cross margin rate is at a per product level, it doesn't make sense, right? Because there are some products which are loss making, but you know, why, why do I need it? But when you actually relate it to the emotional angle, right? So when you do a customer survey and then you say, what is the most, you know, visible product according to you in your shelf, the product that they have a gross margin, which is almost at a negative level is a product which matches the product that you see in most kitchens, right? So it can be, you know, for example, Tata is really valuable and really trusted by Indian consumers throughout the uh, world. But if you look at Tata Salt, it might not make a lot of money by itself, but every household identifies Tata Salt and Purity, mm. right? So you have to look at it from a qualitative lens as well. And when you say gross margin, I'm making a loss on a certain product. Am I able to use it to sell through a different product, right? Am I use, able to use trust to sell through a different product? Does it impact on my conversion rates for a new product or my sales and marketing spends on a new product? And that's what really, from a finance perspective, you have to be able to bring the language of this is the journey that a particular user or particular product takes. And that product has the ability to carry other products into a household. And hence, I want to you know, be able to study them together or collective and not as individual products. Itself. So this way, each business is very different. I, you know, since a lot of work that we do, obviously, considering that we are in Bangalore is on, is on you know, tech finance. 
right? A lot of it goes into the intangibles, right? So for example, uh, if you look at CLTV, now CLTV is in the process of building, right? You don't have your actual predictable CLTV till three, four years of, you know, uh, for example, a customer or a client's uh, relationship with you. But you can make a very predictive guess about it using the kind of activate, activation rate that they have, right? So for example, if he's, if he's a DAU and he's an MAU, is he likely to stick on for longer, right? If he's just featuring in my MAU, I always am at a risk that he's you know going to drop out because he's not using it as aggressively as I want him to, right? Or the number of users per account, right? So uh, each of these metrics by themselves have a small story to say, but they reflect very heavily on some of the other master metrics like CLTV uh, has, right? Like, or CAC recovery has. And these have to be looked at from a lens, like another company that we work with, which, which, has, which had a premium product, uh, uh, right? So in a freemium model, these guys come into the, you know, funnel, they spend some time, you know, you spend a lot of time educating them, you make these video walkthroughs, and you put in a lot of effort, a lot of capital into really establishing the systems that, that are going to be important to convert them into a paid customer. But if you're not able to convert them into a paid customer, then your whole business model is at risk, right? Irrespective of how much you build, you know, spent on acquiring that customer. So if they did not fix this, then they're not going to be able to establish a good CLTV because the CLTV will get averaged out by all the accounts that you have added. And then, you know, somewhere you're going to pay the price on the valuation side, right? right. So the way you look at it is all these metrics are correlated, but as you follow one metric back, then you start seeing, hey, I need to work on activation, right? Like I need to get that guy, you know, from an MAU to DA, right? And that's going to be my focus rather than, you know, my LTV is, is low or it's high or it's dropping or whatever it is. You have to go all the way back because you know the fundamental business is built on those concepts. Right. Yeah. I think as Ashwat Damodaran says, you know, it has to be both the story and the numbers. It's yeah. You can't take only one. Uh, you know, at your convenience. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. 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 So uh, you know, you mentioned Bangalore and tech startups. So one question that came to mind is, uh, you know, when do companies sort of you? We spoke about when you think is the right time for you to uh, you know get in but uh, what is happening on the ground when are companies and founders bringing you in uh, is it the investors who are bringing you in uh, has that been the case and you know what is the real value that uh, companies whether they are investors or the founding teams are looking from a cfo partner uh, to deliver right uh, is it like is there a worry of you know okay these, these people are going to come and bring in a lot more order to the chaos that defines a startup. You know, is that a worry? Can you talk through that? I, I know my multiple questions yeah, sure. you know, baked into yeah. one, but yeah. All right. So, um, you know, I think most of the time, I think the founders and the investors have, uh, um, have similar agendas, right? Like what they want uh, out of it. There probably are some additional agenda points for an investor that probably a founder might not have or might not see today. But together, what they want to run is a really efficient or successful business that's capable of adding a lot of enterprise value, right? So that's that's foundationally uh, what they want. Now, investors, to some extent, I would say to a large extent, uh, good uh, accounts that we work with, large accounts that we work with, are investor introductions, right? And they bring us in and say that, hey, here's an agile or flexible way in order for you to add some capability. Right? And then we, you know, come inside and say, identify, you know, we can do this bit for you, we can do that bit for you, and then start off the relationship. But as we kind of keep going down that uh, uh, valley, the uh, work that we do kind of matures with every business or with every organization, because initially it will be very initiative driven. Later on, it becomes it becomes a kind of like a glue, like an ether uh, within them, right? So you need to do anything within that whole range. They say, oh, let me call on these guys or let me call these guys. Can they, can they execute it for us? Um, typically, the, the place at which we enter a relationship is when they have raised Series A, right? If you have to say from a funding perspective. So the second they are about to raise or they have raised is when they have a real uh, important need for somebody like us to come on board because there is a huge gap in capabilities, right? So, you know, in the in the pre-series A stage, they're still figuring out things, right? They're still experimenting with things. But the second they hit series A, somebody is giving them capital, which is like an injection, right? Now, when you have that capital, you can either be very, very prudent with it, which is also not very good, or you 
can be extremely you know optimistic about the way things are and then run out of runway right you don't want either case now what we come in to do is if every decision that you had had a cost benefit analysis had one mar- uh, roi mindset what could you do right so it just bounces things off is is becomes a lot easier when you have somebody who brings in you know experiences uh, from outside of this uh, of of the organization that you're with just as a validation and to as you know some way of measuring and some way of putting guardrails because we can flag off things very independently that they sometimes might not have not even have thought of right but the second we come in and say hey this is a, this is a risk area that you that you're not looking at or this is a metric that you really need to focus on right like if we say okay you're doing well you're getting a lot of customers but we see that in the 7th or 8th month uh, you know you're having a churn right like from a cohort now when they look at it they say oh that's an eventual life cycle right i what i am looking to do is can it be 9th month right what can we do differently in the 7th month to get it to 9th month now these are realizations that actually they would have had had they had enough bandwidth or time to be able to spend on you know doing these deep dives which somebody else is doing for you on the back burner right you just you just focusing on things that are important right now. um so that way for us i think the first time an investor kind of participates or comes in uh, we've come in an earlier seed we've stayed uh, um, i think series f uh, we've done even some companies which you know after ipo and uh, we've worked with uh, organizations like that as well but uh, typically it's in this range right? and most of the time after series f or g or h or any of the you know uh, alphabets they want a skill set like ours the first thing that they do is they call us up and say can we acquire right obviously they have the money and you know they can buy a team like ours and if it's not us then they will get somebody who's who's done this role for them several times over or you know maybe in another organization uh, but it's a it's, it's you know like having you know a million or or 2 do- or 2 million dollars available to you to just spend on getting a team on board which a very very large organization can do right but 2 million dollars when you have 5 million dollars in your bank is not worth it correct <laughs> right <laughs> yeah yeah and um, you know again a follow up question uh, on that so how does your sort of you know sales cycle work then what are uh, you know your insights into how you know your customer acquisition channels are working so most of it i mean um, uh, i would say it's fortunate till some stage but it's unfortunate uh, 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 at some point right like the fortunate part is i think a lot of the work that we get is from referrals um, mm-hmm. so a lot of people do you know enquire that whether we can work with them participate with them or uh, you know do some bits for their organization um, and most of these are you know either investor uh, based uh, connects or sometimes a portfolio company that we have worked with makes a founder makes a recommendation to another founder right and uh, since it's something very specific to them as a business and, and you know it works completely with them and the team again is is you know highly heavily jumbled right and one thing that we as professionals uh, are do is we have a way like you want any data about any any company that works with us you don't get it right simple right and at the same time the experts that we consult even though they are from the same business the experts that we consult on both of them are very different right so i can have one expert who's working with me on on let's say one you know micro mobility start, startup and i can have a completely different expert on another micro mobility startup just because the business model is different right so uh, that way you are able to trust uh, that one organization will be able to fill that vacuum for uh, multiple such founders and uh, that's also the curse of consulting right that you have to kind of you know uh, rely on on that to be the primary channel but we have started seeing that you know spending a lot of time and energy on on content and thought leadership that's also providing a lot of trickle down uh, benefits and uh, um, you know not even if not directly i would say indirectly like all the alma mater uh, organizations that you know i would i would work with uh, they also say hey you know i've been following you guys i saw this thought leadership uh, thing or i saw this white paper it's very interesting do you guys want to come down and have a chat with us again it's luck right a large part of it is luck which is what we're trying to shake off we're trying to be more organized and then try to create a process out of it simply because you have to be able to operate in a in a lean fashion right you don't want uh, um, you know to set up a 10 member sales team mm-hmm. for a consulting company unless and until it's a very large consulting company that works on you know those kind of project but i would say 2 to 3 months is uh, the amount of time that uh, it requires from the first connection to as actually working 
Uh, if it's urgent, you know, it's as it's as short as like we've got clients, uh, we've got a call in the morning, and that evening we finalized and, and you know starting working on. But it's very specific, like you know, get me a valuation that I that I can use to uh, discuss with an investor or a potential uh, uh, you know a strategic partner, right? So uh, the urgency that they have and whether or not you have the ability to fulfill it and the trust uh, plays a larger role. So I would not say it's a typical sales cycle compared to most of the other you know, larger enterprise uh, uh, sales business models, uh, but it will be more focused and more specific to the use cases. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I can see so many parallels with what we do. <laughs> the, the way you have, uh, you know, articulated this, I think you could have just, you know, sp- said that. So I'm sorry for you. you. <laughs> <laughs> and all of that would have been true, right? So, yeah. yeah. So, I was really intrigued by this line on your LinkedIn, you know, uh, profile, which said, good businesses are built with good people, great businesses are built with good people armed with great systems. So, let's, let's just dissect this. What do you mean uh, by this? And where is it that people, uh, you know, lack in terms of building this these great systems is it intent is it uh, capability is it ability to actually follow those great systems where is it that uh, you know people uh, go wrong right um so if you look at if you you know if you really go down to dissect i'll just borrow something that we were you know we were talking about just a few seconds back um you know your zero to one phase right all that matters is a great founding team okay. like how you're able to get a product out how you're able to get your mvp out that's what establishes whether or not you have a business to start off with, right? And then one to 10 stage, your early team members are your champions. You know, they're going to further the cause. They're working on getting, you know, all uh, all the bits that require validation the, or the hypothesis that you have about the market that they're, they're looking to, you know, establish all of those things. Now, if you don't set up great systems at that point of time, it will only be, it will only be born to be a zero to one company, right? Uh, and then from a one to 10 company, you will barely make it but the cracks will start showing when somebody puts in the money and says, you know, take it to 100, right? So you'll have a great organization till it's 10, but from 10 to 100, you have to work backwards and say, oh, we've made big mistakes, right? But the guys who have built successful businesses, at least at the 10 to 100, are the guys who started putting in these systems at the 10, at the 1 to 10 stage, right? Like they started saying, oh, this is how you measure success, right? Or this is how you measure a failure. Right. Or for example, if there is a growth experiment that I want to run, right, then this is what I expect for, as an outcome from this. Right. Understand until they're doing this as a practice, uh, it loses its cause along the way. And then you end up doing way too much because you have a number of people, you know, you have a number of cogs that are all operating simultaneously. And unless you have that already built, it's all going to go down. Right. Because you're going to do everything inefficiently. And when you do everything inefficiently, your runway is always a problem. You're always raising capital, which means your founder is continuously doing the task of going and selling the organization as compared to selling the product, mm. right? Which is which is a very difficult cycle to kind of get out of. All of these guys have intent, right? No founder will say that I do not want great systems to be to exist in an organization. But when it comes to prioritization, right? Like if I have to prioritize between growth and if I have to prioritize between systems. If I do not have the equipment or access to machinery or access to talent or people or know-how, then I'm going to be left with me making choices purely on growth. And growth is a choice that is easy to make, right? Because that's what I do. Bread and butter, I know how to sell the organization. I know how to sell the product, right? So when it comes to these, these are difficult decisions for them to make. And they will tend to, like we all do, you know, if it's something that's too complex or too hard or it requires us to learn a new skill, we put it aside and say, at the right time, I will get back to it, right? So uh, I think everybody has intent, but when it comes to really deploying or working to deploy it, what they require is somebody who can who they can trust on and say that, okay, you know, it could be an internal person within the organization itself who's going to say, you know, I'm, I'm the champion of this initiative or this goal, or it could be an external agency, right? Like, you know, the uh, we get called, the big four gets called, a lot of organizations get called to come and, you know, put up systems. But if they have access to something like this, they would do it. Again, provided that they also have the buy-in to make that system work for them, right? And if, if there's no buy-in, they're looking at, you know, you know, one of the early days before the mistake that we used to make, you know, coming out of the big four is also that, you know, we used to take uh, these really heavy, massive uh, presentations, right? And go to the client and then say, you know, this is how it needs to work, right? So you're, what you're trying to do is you're trying to force fit a process that worked for somebody else 
and say this is best practice right it's not right fit it's fit right like for, for your industry it's a good fit but when you come down to the next step of you know what will ensure that they are able to maintain their leanness or they are able to maintain the that speed at which they operate is that you tailor it so that you give them you know the guardrails within which to operate but then they are free to you know use it uh, and not have it hamper the speed at which they respond so um, i think that's you know one of the key things that a great system to a system that's one of the big differences is how responsive is it to where you are as an organization and to your needs itself right okay. and and uh, how do you you know introduce that sense of urgency like you said you know people have great intent but they want to do it at the right time uh, you know when i'm really ready for this right uh, how do you introduce that sense of urgency that yes you know that it needs to be done but it needs to be done now how do you do that okay so i'm going to give you a little little bit of a business secret right sure um now um a large part of the relationship building that that we do right is is um getting to the stage that founders can rely on you for anything right irrespective of the complexity at 10 in the night 11 in the night text me if you have something right and when you get that buy in from a founder or from you know uh, an investor or a board member or anything like that uh, they tend to trust you and take your feel on whether or not they should do something about a particular system right so it's not about you selling a package or you selling a service or you trying to push something down it just has to be a natural growth of the relationship itself that i'm going to also do these processes for you right or maybe i i you know we don't we to a large part we don't do pure risk advisory pure play risk advisory uh, uh, you know setup or any of that because we say you if you can do it efficiently with somebody else don't do it with me right i am honestly interested in how you do as an organization and what goals you are able to hit because i am here for the long run right you might have auditors you might have consultants they will keep churning they will keep you know doing whatever is that but if your processes need to be built to suit then let me be the point of contact that ensures that it happens for you now that urgency can only come if they have that buy in or the trust from you right and a large part of the tech founders when they you know just like the way you guys are having a conversation uh, with me and i don't know but if you see a, for example a marked difference between me and another finance professional that you uh, spoke with right you say okay maybe this guy gets this right or maybe this guy understands what i really need to do at this point of time and they open up right and say that is this a process and if you say this is a priority for you now then it's a measure it's a finally a decision of can i afford to make this uh, work or not and if i can afford to make it then i should just go ahead with it right it's not a question of should i be you know uh, should i be you know spending this much time and energy because when you have somebody to rely on they are going to do it for you right like if you have one neck to catch right like for example uh, i mean uh, no better way to put it but let's say you know you have my neck to catch if you know the process doesn't work out the way uh, uh, it's supposed to work out right and you've done everything as an organization to make it work uh, then you can always come back and say it's not working and right somebody like us will fix it for you right they will, they will help solve the situation rather than you know say that you know you should be spending more time on on something like this right this is typically what the problem uh, you know what problem most of these founders have which is that i don't have enough time to respond to things like i'm 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 having a hard time trying to catch up with things that are happening on the business side i can't sit and focus my attention on something that's you know operational or you know that's something that's not of immediate priority for me so uh, i guess that is important to kind of do with any client or any uh, you know any relationship that we have is at the stage that they feel comfortable which is you know we at least noticed it's it's fairly easy once you start getting into the first month or 45 days into it when they see that you guys you're very different from you know anybody that they've interacted with it becomes easier or or a lot more uh, uh, comfortable for them to you know, kind of rely on you and that's when you need to be able to introduce urgency but from the outside urgency is only sales push which these guys don't have time for and they're going to drop it right yeah i think this is becoming more and more eerie actually as we go uh, along because <laughs> this is like me talking about myself right <laughs> 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 so so the the next question that i had pratim was uh, it's an interesting one because this is something which we are you know seeing in a slightly different context as well so the question that i wanted to ask was based on your experience with a variety of businesses what should founders know on day 0 and the lens that i want to add here is that given our work around culture and i'm sure that is something which you also probably are seeing around systems is that a seasoned founder has a has a different take you know because they've gone through the cycle once they know 
you know that these are the kind of things that i should not be delaying uh, you know too far do you see that and do you see that difference between a first time founder and a slightly seasoned founder and what are the things that the first time founder should really know uh, you know either and, and should not be it after having made mistakes right, uh, right. what are the things that they should know from day one see one one good thing that i find about about the you know the overachiever founders right is is that they have a very very less hesitance correct right? they're more open to give a new relationship a try mm-hmm. if they find an intellectual match right if they don't find an intellectual match write it off yeah. right like that's not going to happen they they will you know probably not respond to you but uh, the second you're able to trust somebody to the level that okay there is potentially a way for this person to add value now they are happy to trust that guy and, and you know give them the responsibility or give them charge uh, of an initiative itself uh, and they are very happy to also participate with you on what those outcomes are right but they don't micromanage right at the same time you know they're not coming down of what happened this week right what happened next week there are guys who say this is the outcome that we have we have three months give me the way in which you're going to establish roi on on what you're doing or what you're thinking about Right? and they want to participate in that roi setting and that you know the kpi or okr setting even though we are somebody on the outside they want to include us into that process which is you know what i think great founders uh, do very very well and if you have the ability to kind of run something uh, as an initiative because even that whole process of expectation setting can be a 5 minute discussion right but if you don't have the patience to even have a 5 minute discussion then you're setting it up for failure right in respect of who the vendor is or who the uh, thing is because the priority at the end of the day is yours it's not it's not of you know your cfo it's not of your uh, head of finance it's not of your uh, ceo it's not anybody right like you as a founder have that responsibility to uh, do it which means that you need to spend that 5 minutes because that 5 minutes can significantly save you a lot of time in terms of governing or managing uh, how things are going out um but the other bit i think that that great founders also do is you know how to run controlled growth experiments in perpetuity right so i think that's also very important like you know apart from growth experiments it could be even just a relationship experiment right is this going to work out right like okay here's the fees tell me how it will work out and have a go at it right because you know no it, uh, it's not going to hurt anybody you know we'll be a round off compared to the cap that they have raised but uh, it's honestly a small cost to make for a big benefit mm. right but they're able to make that and they're able to say that this is what i want out of this particular initiative and lay that in front of you and then say do what you want right or do what you can right? as long as you're able to justify that this is you know within this parameter you're able to achieve x amount of outcomes and that's that's even internally right so if i'm launching an app there are measurements on what that app should kind of do right is it going to is it going to help me with better stickiness or is it going to help me you know with better uh, uh you know drip marketing or is it going to help me uh, to improve the quality of my uh, you know lead validation process right whatever it is they have to be able to put that goal or objective very clearly defined with certain metrics that they want to hit and that gives a direction for the entire organization to uh, also follow suit um, the other thing is how you how your relationship is with loss and cost right so <clears throat> founders always look uh, you know um, i've seen a lot of founders kind of get and including you know a lot of outside people right the first you know conversation that you have with beer i think one of my posts was about that too is that you know the loss making how are they valuable mm-hmm. right because uh, honestly loss is a definition that that has been given in the pnl statement right it's not a true indicator of what the business is capable of doing or delivering and that's a lot of it is based in the future of that business itself so if for example it's a zomato it might be making a loss today but the relationship that it has the stickiness that it has the ability to command continuous revenue and also be the largest player in a you know you know multi trillion dollar food industry right is massive right it's very hard to create the moat that they have is is you know unflinchable right and uh, if you're valuing them for a small sliver of that you know trillion dollar uh, opportunity then you see okay yeah that's valuable right so the fact that they're making loss because loss by itself as a word is is you know uh, i would say transient and also extremely subjective right if you ask a founder your loss making as an organization yes but i'm making investments right i'm making investments into developing a new culture developing a new habit developing you know my customer profile giving them something that they have not experienced earlier 
if it requires a cost yeah so be it yeah. right but i have all the other metrics to show that how that's going to translate back into uh, you know revenue over time so um, i think the founders that really get it they're not worried too much about you know this loss and cost concept because they're mostly always worried about cost rather than the loss mm-hmm. right yeah so um, you know one thing that you mentioned in in this answer uh, was how you know it is eventually the founders responsibility right uh, but is there a case for others in the organization the cxos the leaders as time goes to become more and more financially aware about you know everything that they are running you know marketing uh, you know head of marketing might want to think finance as well Uh, and not just respond to a founder's questions about you know uh, cac right uh, is there a case for others to also become more and more financially aware and and start thinking in these kind of systems yeah absolutely so you know i think i think what you just mentioned is where kind of culture meets finance right so uh, from a culture perspective every person within the organization you want them to feel a sense of ownership for the outcomes that they're able to deliver right now those outcomes are not necessarily defined right at any point of time right you have all of these metrics that you have to get x number of new accounts on board but why do you have to get that account on board what is the value of that account from an from an organization right like all all most of these guys let's say even the marketing head kind of knows is from a stock option perspective there are a lot of things that happen at a cap table level and you know that my value of stock options is x number right but that's not really the case right what you should be really looking at is me in terms of me adding a new account why is it so important for me to put in the additional effort to close a large enterprise account or to close multiple smaller smaller accounts right what is that lens that you provide them with which to look within the organization and until and unless they understand the story all the way down and all the way up it's very difficult to get them to buy in on what you are doing as an organization because they will just be a cog that plays a role which is limited to their current opportunity and will kill all the leadership intent that they would they probably have or the leadership potential that they already have which you may not have realized right and all of them to some extent have to take ownership right but they don't need to take ownership of the process of setting those measurements right or of process of driving those numbers or those metrics they have to be more enrolled on to what those metrics mean to the organization and why it's important to they specific to the metrics that you actually have a proper control over which is you know the foundation behind okrs right like hmm. i mean the reason that okrs are able to drive agile decision making uh, in most of these startups which have an extremely uh, uh, you know extremely quick cycle for decisions uh, is because you're able to drive that concept of what you're doing and how does that relate to the overall organization plan and organization map right so i think that way trying to be able to do that one is to get the culture in place that everybody is you know feels accountable to the outcomes of the organization second thing is to have these metrics already placed before them so that they know what they're working towards right yeah if you don't have either of them then i mean what's the point right yeah, and you yeah. yeah now it's getting scarier because you are actually using words that my customers are also using with me okay <laughs> so the actually so the, the reason why i said that is you know uh, a series c funded company they actually said that we want to you know sort of rework our culture because of you know the they have this value of ownership and uh, he said i want my right. people to know that ownership doesn't mean ownership of their own kpis but the way the founders see or define the word ownership is that whatever is best for the company is what they should be owning and not you know their personal kpis right so right. it, it again boils down to that how am i fitting into the larger picture how am i that you know what is that jigsaw puzzle where do i fit in if they get that whole thing and they're bought into invested into the whole uh, you know vision that's when they're going to do that right otherwise right. there will be this worry that oh this is my kpi i have to deliver on this it doesn't matter whether it's going to you know it be at odds with what the company is looking for i think is a great uh, you know great example right. that that uh, you know, you've given here thanks for that so um you know over the last you know few years of your experience you know from your experience with uh, you know kpmg and and now you know what you are doing with uh, prequate so if i were to ask you what are the three things that you know about finance and startups that others don't what would those three things be like that's a Uh, that's way too many things. <laughs> I have to I have to try and prioritize. Uh, <laughs> um, 
yeah so i think one of the biggest realization which i also hinted uh, uh, at right is uh, in order for something to work in order for something to be valuable you have to also have the operational bandwidth to be able to execute it right um, it's great if you have great advice you know when when i came in from the big four um, you know a large part of what i thought uh, was real about the world was that you have to be very very good technically uh, in order to provide great advice uh, but now over the last 10 11 years uh, what i've also realized is if unless and until you're able to actually work with them to execute advice and put it uh, uh, into action it's very difficult to really have an you know lasting impact on any organization or any business and if you're not working with impact as a lens your relationship length with a with a business is always going to be short right um, and that's not going to be sustenance and listen until you have a regulatory body that imposes that you have to do this every year or you have to do this every quarter or you have to do this every month right uh, so if you have to really kind of work well in consulting that's one thing that you have to keep in mind is what is the impact that you've been able to deliver um, i think the second thing that i would uh, uh, think you know from startups uh, and uh, uh, finance element is um, how closely you hold uh, you know numbers and topics and ideas to yourself uh, is how small you will be as an organization, right? Unless and until you're able to kind of provide these numbers, ownership, accountability to people within the organization, you're not going to be able to control all the things that happen. You're not going to be able to respond in time, right? So that's a personal learning that, that we as an organization also had is that, you know, we would invest so much in operational machinery, right? But today, if you look at us, we're a rhombus shaped structure, right? We're not, we're not a pyramid shaped structure. Mm-hmm. Most of the people have ownership for the outcomes that they work with. Clients can perceive the difference that that you know even at eleven o'clock somebody is responding to an email, or uh, when they're making a pitch event, you know they uh, somebody here is is you know observing the call. They don't need to. I mean they don't. It's not necessary, right. but it makes things more valuable for them as an organization that you have the buy-in continuously, mm-hmm. right? And with an external vendor or a partner. To be able to get the same buy-in as somebody within the team itself, uh, I mean that that's a great gift, right? If I, if I were on the client side, I think that's the main thing that I kind of would look for from a, a vendor as well is how motivated are they for the outcomes that you know I'm getting as a as an organization or a business. I think the other thing is uh, if you don't have ROI mindset, right? Uh, uh, at every level, at every business level, right? At every initiative level, at every organizational level. If you don't have an ROI mindset of what you're able to add, what this decision is that you're taking in, what you expect out of it, it's going to run at length with you doing a lot of inefficient or ineffective choices, which actually can be avoided completely. Right? Just that you have to spend five more minutes on planning uh, what you're doing and visualizing. I mean, not not to use you know the secret kind of language, but uh, not, not but visualizing what you want as outcomes. Right? I think that's another important learning that you know founders and professionals kind of need to have is that how can you visualize um, uh, you know objectives or you know results with them before you start kind of embarking on uh, something else. So these are these are you know the truths that I would say that you know founders. I mean they probably have it in the back of their mind, but the, it's not something that you know is glaringly upfront. Right? They want to think ROI, but when they get into day to day ops, they like ROI can wait. <laughs> right now, I have more to do than than to think. Right. Yeah. We'll get to that. Uh, you know, in in some time is, is how they right. uh, think. All right. So last couple of questions, and uh, you know, we're going to go slightly away from all that we have discussed okay. uh, till now. So we read your LinkedIn uh, post about not reading newspapers, but reading extensively about business and current affairs. <laughs> so how has that experience been like? You know, uh, are, are you happy? What have you missed? Any news item that uh, you thought you should you, you know you should have heard about earlier than when it reached you? You know, a lot of people kind of also ask me within the office, right? So I'm, I'm the only one who doesn't have a newspaper uh, or doesn't touch the newspaper uh, when he comes in. And you know, my my partner he is a reader, like you know, like a newspaper reader. Like he uh, he reads uh, stuff. He has these applications which send him uh, news. Uh, now. I used to be that too, like maybe about seven or eight years back. Mm-hmm. But then I realized that, I mean, with a lot of research that uh, as limitless as your brain is, it's also very structured, mm-hmm. right? Now, a lot of information doesn't doesn't necessarily mean great analysis, right? Because you're moving from one article to the other article. Most of that information is kind of just 
you know, points of data which are structured into a paragraph and presented to you about a certain topic. Now, the topic probably has no relevance or has a lot of story which is going, you know, yet to unfold or has already unfolded. Right? The context of which are not available, is not available. Now, in order for you to be able to understand or to read, I spent a lot of time with alternate media, right? You know, which talks about analysis, which talks about why a certain piece of news is important, why a piece of information is important. Because I don't believe, you know, we are, we are all sitting here playing KBC. Right? Nobody's come, going to come up and ask me, you know, what is the capital of that country, right? Um, and I don't need to know it either, right? Um, that stage of you retaining information is, is over. Now it's about how you can process information at a certain age and, you know, certain time is how you can process deeper views or deeper analysis. And that's going to be more critical, right? So if I see 10 new snippets of information, I might skim through all 10, but read only one article. Right? But when I read that article, I read that subject matter. I don't read that specific piece of news or information. So if I find something interesting, like you know, Tata New coming coming out, right? I'll read about the journey of Tata Tata New, how they came up with the concept, you know, what it's going to mean for the Indian consumer, rather than saying, hey, Tata New came up and you know, X number of merchants and X number of services are all together. So I feel that you know we spend way too much time trying to absorb information uh, and very little time trying to absorb analysis. And analysis will not, uh, uh, you know, is not probably as efficient as, as consumption of more data points. But again, nobody on the street or no founder is going to ask me, oh, did you read about that tax law that just came out, right? He's going to ask, you know, from a foundation perspective, what is the decision that I make, need to make? Like, oh, first principles, tell me what, I, what decision I need to make, right? And that's where you need to be valued. Or that's where you need to be, you know, some, something, somebody who can add a lot more perspective than what he's already carrying. So that way, I think I feel it's better to read. So, for example, if I like a certain topic, uh, you know, for example, uh, when Airtel changed its logo, I read a book about called Biology, about the science behind logo design because it didn't seem like a very big change, right? But if you're spending millions and millions of dollars to rebrand, there has to be a story why, right? Now, when I read Biology, I started to read, okay, you know, there, there is a lot more depth to how brands want to be perceived how brands to be uh, to be visualized and when you do that now i might not have known all the companies that change their their logo or branding but neither does anybody else right because your mind you know your ram refreshes right <laughs> only what what is important or necessary but uh, if you ask me how a logo is important or if you ask me how we for example like pre-page branding is and there i can tell you the story behind the branding why we use certain colors why we certain you use certain cues within the you know branding, and that's more useful to the world at large than you just having the same information that everybody else has. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't know if that if that's a very long answer to a very short question, but uh... <laughs> no, that leads to the next question. So you mentioned a lot of alternate sources uh, of you know alternate media. So what are these books, podcasts, uh, <clears throat> courses, people um, you know that you follow on social media? who have really influenced your thinking and, you know, who would you recommend to our listeners? Um, sure. So, uh, the, you know, most of the use of social media for me uh, is very specific to, uh, let's say, LinkedIn and the world around, mm-hmm. around me, right? Like, these are people that I already know and then I want to see what they're up to or there's potentially a client that I would love to work with, um, right? And then I'm following them and then trying to understand what is happening with them. So, I would say the value of social media is kind of reserved for that, uh, uh, but when you look at, you know, for example, uh, I listened to uh, How I Built This by Guy Raz. I, you know, it's a, it's a pretty popular podcast. But the real way in which a founder thinks or the stories and the journeys is very valuable to me. Right? You can see the pivots and why they thought through those pivots. And then you can, you can develop a genuine appreciation for them as a business or an, as, an, as an organization. And another uh, one that I uh, listened to is Plant Money, uh, again from NPR. Which talks about you know some of the things that that are happening in economics. Right? You know, one of the uh, episodes that I listened to, I think two weeks back, uh, is about you know GDP is GDP the real indicator that we need to be looking at, right? Or is or you know are there alternate indicators in order to measure productivity as an organization? Uh, sorry, as a as a country, right? That gets you to think a lot further. So that's another one that I follow. Um, there's one more called Invisibly. Uh, which talks about you know the um, science behind a lot of the everyday choices that we um, that we make um, you know and also has a lot of great case studies and examples of things and, and you know how they function and how they work 
Uh, there's another one uh, from Reid Hoffman. Uh, I think it's called Masters of Scale, uh, which I listened to, uh, where you know he goes through a particular uh, topic or a particular phase in a business or an organization and how they dealt with it and what assets did they rely on, what did they try to build, and you know where did you know how did they find out that they were going wrong, uh, which also I find extremely valuable. So when it comes to podcasts, again, it's driving time uh, that you know I spend most of the time consuming. Uh, or it's you know sitting uh, in the back seat, or uh, you know like when a colleague is you know coming to office with a colleague. So that's the time that that I spend. Basically, the non-productive time where I can't really read the mm-hmm. book. But apart from that, there are a number of other books. Like you know, one of my favorite books of all time uh, is called uh, Nudge. I don't know if you've heard of it yeah, yeah. Uh, by Richard Thaler. Mm-hmm. Um, right, beautiful book about how how to construct decisions. Right, like you know, even writing an email gets so much more refined. The second you learn that choice architecture is behind most of the decisions that we make, mm-hmm. right? If I use a certain phrase, uh, you know, phraseality in, in a request, I'm able to get the other person to be able to make a decision about something, right? That's very valuable. And that's not going to be useful today or it's not going to be useful tomorrow. It's going to be useful for life, right? Or um, another uh, great book is uh, the one small thing, uh, Gary Keller, right? Um, which shows how you can focus on the thing that matters and, you know, scrap out all the noise, right? And get to that single uh, uh, single point that requires fixing or get to that single leaky tap, right? In order for you to fix everything within the organization. It's a beautiful perspective or a beautiful way to look at things because we need to be able to declutter, right? If there's so much, especially when you work with, you know, I've, I've probably consulted maybe more than over 200 businesses. Right, like, um, and with more than two hundred businesses, and with each business being completely new, um, it's very easy to get just kind of embroiled with everything that's happening. Right, and then your decision making becomes very clouded and very difficult. The second you start thinking about everything in in its totality, and when you start identifying and narrowing down on specific things that you probably need to do with an organization, then it becomes a lot more valuable. Right, so I think Gary Keller's book is is another important thing, and uh, one more book is. Uh, Range, uh, yeah, which is you know, which I which I all you know believed right from uh, the big four days that uh, you know generalists are going to play a very very vital role going forward as um, you know everything else around in the world is trying to become more easier, more friendlier, become less complex, uh, become more transparent. Uh, I think generalists are going to play a vital role because they are the guys who can connect the dots, right? Like across the world, they are the ones uh, who are. Uh, playing one of the you know key things that for example we as an organization right is our our sell point uh, you know which is to a la- to a large number of our clients is visible is is you know T shaped learning hmm. right? like why why should you work with a consultant honestly right like you know why don't you build these capabilities in house right you know have the bunch of guys you know spend half a million dollars a million dollars get you know get a team in house and dedicated to uh, work with you but what you're not able to do is T shaped learning. Right, which is where McKinsey, BCG, Bain, you know, have their, uh, uh, you know, have their whole business model, right? Like uh, a person with, let's say, fifty odd organizational uh, experiences, when he comes down within an organization, he's carrying from blocks of expertise of what worked, right? Like for a business, and then trying to bring it to you for zero learning curve, right? And he's not, you know, going to spend two years in order for him to, for you to get that benefit. He's coming in with, on day one with it, right? So you can go really deep into an organization, get the right block, and it become even better if you have four or five people with T-shaped learning who are coming together and collaborating and you know, providing uh, you with a solution. And you're just sitting on the outside or you hiring a team and saying, this is what you need to be doing, right? Or this is the organization goal, figure things out, right? And then over here, you're saying that, hey, help me with profitability. And you've got four guys, all with their experience across 50, 60 organizations coming in, working together, collaborating for you with a specific outcome as, as, the, uh, as the answer. Right? So you're digging into years and years of learning, which is available in, in one single place. So you, unless and until that kind of an approach is, is really there, which actually true blue generalists uh, are able to you know, kind of bring in into an organization, it's, it's not very, very valuable. Right? Because everything, you know, systems have kind of replaced a lot of the things that were done back then, right? Um, your efficiency and effectiveness at an operational level is, is at an all-time high, right? Now you have to concentrate completely on effectiveness, 
and that's where generalists try. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like like the book says that right? uh, you know Federer's. uh experience in playing yeah. so many different ball sports is what makes him federer right <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah. yeah yeah so all right we we've, we've come to the end of our uh, conversation pratimna but we got to not let you go without your hot takes on on certain things so this is our last yeah. section in all our uh, you know conversations where we ask you for your what do you think is the future relevance of Yeah, you know certain topics, right? So the first one, first question for you is, what do you think is the future relevance of mainstream media? Now that you have almost sort of, you know, sacrificed it, or you're not a user anymore, what do you think is the future relevance of mainstream media? No, I think the the role that you know the media uh, is play uh, uh, used to play is always going to remain, right? But obviously, the formats in which they're going to be disseminating information has changed. They've all moved to digital. but the role is is of that guy who is coming into town and then beating the drum and saying that this is the set of activities that have happened during the year whatever is relevant out of it please absorb hmm. it is going to continue there is no way of 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 you know uh, um, you know bypassing it the second thing is it is always going to stay relevant because the advertisers that build the industry right who need this circulation uh, are not going to want to give up that circulation to let's say you know google or something like that which excludes a lot of people from mm. you know access right uh, um, so that's going to be another big uh, thing but if you look at it let's say you know 10 years in or 15 years in digital is going to be the way the whole world operates right and you are going to have a lot more funded projects like you know the uh, fact that uh, like npr right one of my favorite uh, uh, publishing houses uh, is able to create content or the way individual guys like you or guys like vox or guys like uh, uh, vice are able to create content i think the quality of content the quality of investigative journalism the quality of of research is only going to improve mm. right because now you have people who are viewing it who are going to you know be spending money rather than an advertiser who's going to be spending money right so you which means you have millions across the world who can potentially be paid patrons to uh, uh, to your content as compared to just a couple of them So maybe ten years in, I would find that they would be redundant. But I would say, at least in the near future, the fact that there is no better distribution channel, uh, right? Yeah, I think will will ensure that they sustain. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Next one is, what do you think is the future relevance of traditional startup hotspots like Bangalore, Hyderabad, Pune, Gurgaon? Is that going to? I mean, are they still going to be relevant? Is it going to go to other cities, places? Um. so here i have a little bit so you know though the world has been you know talking about flat flattening of the um, thing right so i think it's still going to be hubs right uh, for example bangalore is a hub or pune is a hub or hyderabad is a hub now between them i think the hubs itself are going to continue because they serve as great catchment areas for talent now in order for talent to come and visit and spend time they should also have an ability or a flexibility to move from one organization to the other organization right which is this is like again you know it's a uh, uh, like ouroboros right so you have all the companies which are you know setting up in a cluster which has talent all the talent coming because all the com- companies are are setting up in a cluster uh, but uh, what you have been seeing of late is a lot of talent which you know is comfortable working out of these metros simply because there's a lot of access to technology there's a lot of access to internet and uh, you know like mysore is a developing hub right i mean who would have thought that a uh, tier 2 city in karnataka who can also be a technology hub mm. right but it's becoming a technology hub right and all the hubs that are there today i think they will continue to grow but you might have a lot more newer hubs but it's because the overall size of the pie is increasing rather than them replacing each other or them getting you know dissipated into uh, uh into a lot more you know smaller hubs okay and the final one uh slightly off topic what is the future relevance of social media influences so um so okay so i think you know influencer right so that that's a beautiful word right <laughs> um i mean forget about social media uh, the world that we kind of live in is going to always be led by um, somebody saying something then right? with social media there are a lot more people who are providing their opinion about you know uh, the recent thing about what's a uh, uh, you know social uh, media led commerce right you know huge number of startups that are that are going because now earlier you wanted a celebrity to endorse the product now you want yourself to be endorsing the product 
yourself as a not me as an individual but i want somebody like me endorsing the product right because i trust that somebody else is also going to be able to provide the same kind of validation that a celebrity would because a celebrity doesn't care right like i mean celebrity is doing it for a large format you know um, a massive media format so since the whole world is kind of switching to you know buying things based on recommendations and experiences you know a simple indicator is the amount of effect that reviews have right on on the way you buy um so i think social media influencers will continue to um, kind of dictate but their role is going to become a lot broader because now their audiences will be engaged rather than just content will also be engaged for commerce right so i mean earlier you would have merchandise from companies you know coming in and and you know they would they would buy my t-shirt support my uh, channel then you had the guys like patreon who said that why don't you you know create followership uh, and you have many of the other models that you know obviously they're not they're not used for uh, completely nice users but uh, there are other uh, platforms where you can pay a subscription mm-hmm. in order to uh, you know like only fans i don't want to say it but yeah. like only fans right when you can very give a subscription to follow a particular uh, person right so i think influencers is going to go down that route because the quality of the content is going to uh, define uh, who really finds it relatable and then their uh, relevance to you is going to spread a lot deeper into what you do on a day to day level you know apart from just consuming content mm-hmm. so today that just consuming content is 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 what is happening right so uh, a lot of media and advertising agencies are kind of pump, pumping money in but the second you're not being paid for views anymore i think you're going to start looking at alternate ways to uh, you know monetize your followership right on that note i think this is a fantastic uh, you know conversation pratidna i think we covered a whole range of topics from you know what a growth focused uh, you know outsource cfo partner is how does it fit into the you know in, into the realm of a founder what value do you add uh, you know how do you do business development we spoke about a variety of things i think this is one of those conversations where we've done you know justice uh, to to the whole uh, topic um, yes there were a lot of eerie moments for me because there was not <laughs> there are a lot of things that you were saying which would have been completely true you know for uh, choose to think as well but uh, i think this was one of the best conversations that we had thanks a lot to you thank you thanks arish thanks and i'm i'm really happy eh, because we didn't spend too much time on finance <laughs> so, much, <laughs> so I, was, i was wondering did, did i alienate myself from from the objective for this conversation itself but uh, i'm happy if you if you uh, you know more than anything like the conversation right if you like this we know you care about your and your team's future relevance you can find us and Now click on the subscribe button on YouTube, Spotify, Google and Apple Podcasts. You can also find us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram. There are two ways to enter the insider group of friends of CTQ. A Telegram channel where you'll get daily tidbits that help you think about future relevance and our weekly email newsletter called The Up Leveler. We've got some fabulous testimonials from our subscribers. We share special discount codes for CTQ compounds and exclusive invitations to our events on both these channels. Just go to choose to think dot com. That is think with a Q, and you will find all the links to subscribe. You owe it to yourself.